Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of How to Live to 200. On today's episode, I had the opportunity to connect with Dr. Matt Caberline, a University of Washington professor and researcher focused on the basic biology of aging. Matt got his PhD at MIT under the legendary aging researcher Lenny Garanta, who I hope to get on the show one day. And Matt's lab at UW is one of six Nathan Schock Centers of Excellence in Basic Biology of Aging. So he's at the top of the heap when it comes to studying this topic area. In this episode, we dive deep into what Matt means and doesn't mean when he discusses caloric restriction and why he thinks the latest research in this area is, well, to use his words, unsatisfying. We dig into why he launched the Dog Aging Project, which studies aging in dogs as a proxy for human aging, and why he's very optimistic about drugs such as rapamycin, metformin, and acarbose for treating age-related diseases. I'm a dog lover. Matt's a dog lover. I'm sure some of you are dog lovers. And if nothing else, we end up learning what's going to make man's best friend live a lot longer. And the best case, we can live a lot longer with them. I really enjoyed my discussion with Matt, and I hope you will too. And now, this is How to Live to 200. Uh, so Matt, welcome to the show. So how does a BA in math end up as a PhD in biology from MIT? Uh, accident. Uh, so I actually went to graduate school. So I actually have, have got two degrees as an undergraduate. One was in math and one was in biochemistry. And I went to graduate school thinking I was going to do structural biology or, or x-ray crystallography or something like that, because that's, that's what I knew. And um, my first semester... Uh, in graduate school, I heard a talk by a professor at MIT named Lenny Garenti, where he was talking about how his lab was um, studying aging, and in this case, it was in a single-celled model in budding yeast. Um, and I was just kind of fascinated by the idea that you could you could study something as complicated as aging using biochemistry and molecular biology and genetics. I had never thought about that before, and, and I really got turned on to the idea, so I went and talked to Lenny. Um, and I ended up uh, performing my graduate research in his lab based on that discussion. And so it really, it really was um, a chance that I heard this talk. And, and I, I look, looking back, you can kind of think about periods in your life where you were going down one track and then all of a sudden you were going in a completely different direction. And that really was the situation for me. And I'm so glad that it happened because um, I, I've become passionate about the biology of aging and trying to understand aging. And that's, that's really what I've devoted my career to since then. And what was it like uh, with Lenny specifically? What was the lab like at that point in time? You're our second guest who's actually studied under, under with Lenny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who was the first? Uh, the team from Inside Tracker. Oh, Gil, sure, yeah. So we, we didn't overlap at all, but I've certainly come across him um, since then. So, yeah, so the time when I was in Lenny's lab, I, I think, was um, a really uh, exciting and interesting time in the history of his lab. Because when I started in the lab, um, it was still about half focused on transcription and about half on aging. So he hadn't even at that point completely made the shift all the way to studying aging. And there were, there were lots of really um, interesting and super smart people in the lab at that time. So David Sinclair was a postdoc in the lab at the same time I was a graduate student. Uh, Brad Johnson, who's now at Penn, was in the lab at the time. Um, and so it was a really dynamic um, and intense environment, I would say. Shin Amai also was a, a postdoc in the lab. He's the, the uh, person who discovered the catalytic activity of sirtuins as what are called NAD-dependent deacetylases. Um, so it was a really dynamic time in the lab. And, um, and so I think that I really benefited from being around all of these smart and driven and intense people um, because it really, I think, helped me think about uh, the biology of aging in, in new ways and certainly contributed to my success as a graduate student. Um, Lenny was, uh, I would say, a fairly hands-off mentor. So he was the kind of person who would throw out lots of ideas um, and then kind of let us percolate on them and work on them. And, and he didn't really take a lot of uh, uh, or, or spend a lot of attention on individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. He kind of guided the ship and, and developed the big ideas. And I think he was also interesting, and this is something I don't do in my own lab, but, um, but he tended to let people uh, argue 
a bit more than I think a lot of people were comfortable with. And I, I think he kind of liked that, um, that intensity in the lab. Uh, and, uh, and so he didn't step in when people would get a little bit heated with each other. He kind of let them most of the time work it out on their own. So there's less argument in your lab. Much, I, well, at least that or I'm aware of. you step in a lot more. You know, it's possible that there's stuff that goes on that I don't know about, but at least from what I'm aware of. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I try to, the way I try to, to run my lab is I really, um, I really, spend a lot of effort uh, trying to make sure that the people I bring into the lab are going to have a positive influence on the personality of the lab. And I also want them to be people that I like to be around. I mean, the way I approach science, I want to have fun doing it. And so I want to be around people that I enjoy being around. And so I think I just spend a lot more time um, before I bring people into the lab trying to, to focus on a, an overall positive and healthy environment in the lab. What's the quick path that takes you from MIT to being in the lab that you have today? <laughs> uh, so I spent ab about a year and a half right out of graduate school at a startup biotech company. It was a company called Longenity. Um, it was started by a guy, guy named Pete Estep, who was a graduate student with George Church, who's at Harvard. Um, and so the goal of that company was to identify biomarkers of human aging. And, and, I will, and this was back in 2001. So I would say we were a little bit ahead of our time. The technology really wasn't there. As, as you, you're probably aware, there are now you know, a dozen startups in this space using um, newer technologies or, or less expensive technologies like, like uh, next generation sequencing and metabolomics and things like that to identify biomarkers of human aging. But we, were, we had the right idea, but we did not have the tools, I think, at that time to really do it well. Um, so that, that company struggled, <laughs> I think it's fair to say. It was a great experience for me because I got to be part of a three-person startup biotech company where you kind of learn that you do whatever needs to be done. If that means you're sweeping the floors, you're sweeping the floors. Um, uh, and so after that, um, I came back to Seattle and did a postdoc with Stan Fields, who's in genome sciences. Uh, I was a postdoc for about three years, and then I was very fortunate to, uh, to have the opportunity to stay in Seattle and start my own lab um, in the pathology department at UW, and that was in 2006. Um, so I've had my own lab now for about 12 years, and it goes by in the blink of an eye. What, you mentioned 10 or 12 companies. What company do you know about today that you're sort of most excited about that may be furthering the vision you had in 2001? Um, so, or are they still sta still state of the art is still two thousand and one. So I think there's a real cha no. I think that I think that um, there are there are some there are still some real challenges with uh, this concept of biomarkers of aging or particularly aging rate is what people are interested in. We don't so much need biomarkers to tell us when somebody's old. Um, we need biomarkers to tell us how rapidly they're aging because that's what you really need to test interventions, right? Let's say I have a drug that I think slows aging. How do I prove it? I could try to do a 30-year clinical trial and actually show that people are living longer and healthier, but that's not reasonable. No pharmaceutical company is going to do that. So what you need are molecular signatures of aging rate, where in a reasonable time frame, you can actually test interventions. Um, and so, so that, as a concept, makes a ton of sense. I think that um, we're still a ways away from actually knowing how to do that. So, so I'm not going to talk about specific companies. I will talk about potentially a viable paths to getting to these kinds of biomarkers. I think um, one area that's, that's really interesting where there's a fair amount of data um, is the idea of epigenetic clocks. So these are modifications to, uh, to DNA or to chromatin in cells that we know uh, are, are very good predictors of chronological age. Um, and there's some evidence that within individuals, there are at least certain signatures in the epigenome that are predictive of biological age, meaning that people who, for a given number of years, their health status seems to be that they're older biologically or younger biologically. So I think that has a lot of potential. It's still um, in some ways in its infancy in terms of being validated, but I think, I think that that technology um, uh, has the potential to be very useful. Um, metabolomics, so the, so the idea that we can look at um, a biological fluid like blood that's fairly easy to get and identify molecules in the blood that are predictive of biological age. There's also a lot of um, potential there. And I think it's the combination of these sort of uh, uh, next generation technologies with the application of deep learning and AI that can actually start to pull out some of these signatures. That intersection is, is where I think there's a lot of uh, uh, potential for, for value. And so there are some companies that are really kind of right in that space that are really trying to take, you know, these, these high density 
types of data and apply deep learning to those to identify signatures that are predictive. The challenge, of course, is still how do you validate that? So let's say that, that a company says, okay, we've got the signature for biological age. We'll look at these 15 or 1,500, whatever it is, markers, and this is going to tell us with some, some level of confidence what your biological age is. How do you actually prove that that's working? And, I, and this is where I haven't really heard um, any good solutions yet because I still think the, the, way you, the way you really prove it is you, you take a group of people, you predict their biological age, and then you wait 20 years and you see if your prediction was right. And again, that's not a feasible path to, to actually validating these things. So, so that's where I would, I, would, I would like to be the person who figures out how to do that, but even more I would like somebody to figure out how to do that. Because I think that's kind of one of the big challenges in the field these days. So we had uh, Gil Blander from Inside Tracker on the podcast. He was one of the people who studied uh, under Lenny and David. And they have a product called InnerAge. So um, I've done InnerAge. Uh, and I think it at least is directionally in the area that you're talking about. I'm quite proud of my 52-year-old uh, age and my 34-year-old I think if you pay more, you get lower. Age. Right. See that. <laughs> right. But I paid for the top one uh-huh. and got the thirty-four-year-old uh, uh-huh. inner yeah. age uh, <laughs> score. Uh, but I think it's interesting you mentioned there's there's both a point in time which is probably, if not definitive, directionally useful, right. and then probably the rate of change is probably more important over time. Is what is changing over time, and then to your point, the interventions that I may try based on my particular set of issues. Yeah, and I think this is, this is an interesting example because there are a few of these different kinds of tests, some of, and they look at different markers. Some of them look at telomere, some of them look at metabolites, some of them look at epigenetics, um, some of them look at multiple markers. So you get a number like that, says, okay, you're, you're 54 years old, but biologically you're 34 years 52 old. 52 must be. Sorry. Okay. 52. <laughs> Sometimes 51, right. depending on where my brain is on the day, what time of the day it is, and whether it's being recorded or not. Gotcha. Um, but then what do you do with that information? And I think this is, so first of all, you know, great. It's nice to see, okay, I'm biologically 34. It makes you feel good. How much confidence do you really have in that? And then secondly, what do you do with that information? And I'm not sure that – and and probably for somebody who who gets the result that they're biologically younger than than their chronological age, um, that feels good. You, probably nothing actionable there. But what if you get the result that you're biologically older than your chronological age? What's the actionable step there? And I don't know that we really have answers at this point. And this is where it gets back to interventions – then you would want to have an intervention that, that somebody who got that result, we could say, okay, so we think you are biologically aging more rapidly than you should be. Here's what you can do to start to fix that. And I don't know, beyond diet and exercise, I don't know that we have anything. And even those, it's kind of at the level of, well, don't eat too much and exercise regularly, which is not that satisfying. Right. That's the theme of this podcast. We go super deep in the science and then always come back into, well, just reduce stress, sleep enough, <laughs> eat well as Michael Pollan might, and you're probably good enough. Yeah. So we're down right. to this point, potentially 0.5 to 1% to 2% change in any one given direction. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, that's right. And, and yet in many cases, a lot of our listeners are in the, let's put ourselves into the maybe category. Let's try and help either with experimentation on ourselves, yeah. experimentation as part of the group, exposing information like the people who are doing hardcore research in this so that we be- become aware of what to look for. Right. With an expectation that maybe we're only making 1% or 2% changes now, but we're laying the foundation to potentially make step function changes in the future. Right. And I think this is, uh, this is a really interesting field to work in um, because – there are lots of people, both scientists and people who follow the science, who are self-experimenting. Um, and I, and I, I mean, I have no problem with that. I think that's fine. If people want to self-experiment, they, they should. Um, uh, what I'm unsure about is how useful that is in terms of knowledge gathering, unless it's done in a rigorous way. And to my knowledge, there's actually very little of that. So, you know, you might be, you might, well, somebody might be taking 10 different supplements um, and and dietary restricting themselves and exercising. Another person may be taking five of those supplements and six others and not dietary restricting. And so how do you actually get to a, a collective data set that you can actually learn something from? And I, I don't know that, that 
um, that as a field, we're actually getting much from all of the self-experimentation that is going on out there. There are some, there are some examples, like I think there was a, a period um, a few years ago where this group called the Calorie Restriction Society, these are people who self-practiced calorie restriction, they had set up a, a website and a mail list and, and were participating with scientists who would actually follow them. And I think we learned something from those studies, even though they're not perfect, they're not controlled clinical trials, um, we did learn some things about, uh, at least in that subpopulation of individuals, what some of the physiological responses are to caloric restriction. And these people were all practicing different types of caloric restriction. So you could say, even given that, there are some general trends associated with caloric restriction in, in humans. I'm not sure we're getting that from the, all of the people out there that are taking metformin or rapamycin or NAD precursors. Or Now there are people taking senolytics. I don't know that we're getting much from that uh, at this do you, point. Do you see a near-term future where that starts to change? Um, well, I don't know. I think that I haven't seen anything yet that makes me think that we're getting close to that. I think that um, there may be some sort of hybrid models, like uh, things like the TAME trial, where they are sort of controlled clinical trials. You guys, uh, should I, can I throw that acronym around? You all know know what that means. Yeah. Where, so this is the targeting Why aging. Why don't you tell yeah. people who might so this not is, know this what it is means. The, the targeting aging with metformin um, clinical trial that uh, that is being um, developed by uh, several scientists near Barzilai at Einstein is, is kind of the person who's, who's taken the lead on publicizing this. Um, so the idea there is to take a drug, uh, in this case metformin, and try to, in a controlled clinical setting, ask the question, can we get evidence that metformin slows aging in people? Um, and the strategy they're taking, which I think is a, is a smart strategy, so this isn't really an aging clinical trial. Um, it's uh, what's called a comorbidity clinical trial. So, so the design here is that in order to get in the study, you have to have one age-related disease, and it can't be diabetes because that's what metformin is normally prescribed for. So it has to be something else. And the question, the end point is, does metformin increase the length of time before you develop a second age-related disease? And that's where comorbidity comes in, two, two age-related diseases. Um, and so the, the, the uh, I think important aspect of this is um, from a regulatory perspective, previously there has, has been no path for companies or individuals to seek FDA approval for a drug to target aging. That's because aging in FDA's eyes is neither a disease nor an indication. And those are the two things you can get a drug approved for. So what, um, what the, the TAME group has done through discussions with FDA is to, to get FDA to at least tentatively agree that a collection of age-related diseases can be an endpoint or an indication. So they won't say that we're going to approve your drug for aging, but they'll say we'll approve your drug for this collection of age-related diseases. And, and so that's, I think, where this is sort of an intermediate step on the regulatory side to, to, to getting to the point where potentially pharmaceutical companies could come into this space and actually see a path towards regulatory approval. Um, because as it stands now, the currently the only products that are making it to market for aging are things that are unregulated. Um, and the problem there is I don't think you're ever going to get rigorous proof that an unregulated compound affects aging because there's really no incentive for a company that's selling an unregulated compound to actually do the experiment because it might not work. Right. Let's come back to dietary restriction. That's an area that a lot of people sort of are talking about uh, in our circles and on the podcast. Yeah. Maybe you can start with what does that mean, and we'll go deeper down the rabbit hole. So, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's actually uh, the big question. What does dietary restriction mean? That's because, why we have you yeah. here. Let's start well, with your I, definition. Yeah. Uh, so my answer is uh, that it's sort of an umbrella term for a variety of nutritional strategies that involve um, restricting one or more nutritional components of the diet that in uh, preclinical studies have been shown to have effects on aging. So, so, I mean, you could talk about dietary restriction paradigms that aren't beneficial. But I, I think for the purposes of this discussion, we're focused on ways that you can modulate diet. Um, and this is, this is usually by taking something out 
where there's some evidence in a laboratory study that it increases lifespan or delays some other phenotype of aging. Um, and, 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 and unfortunately, that's not a really satisfying term because that encompasses a whole wide swath of different strategies. So that could be what is sort of classical caloric restriction, which is you just restrict everything by some amount, typically between 15 and 65%. Um, it could mean taking Generally out... Generally thought of as caloric restriction? That, I think, is what most people would mean if they said caloric restriction. Yeah, dietary restriction, in my view, is sort of a more all-encompassing term that includes right. I don't eat straight meat. caloric I don't eat restriction. Meat, so therefore, I have some form of dietary restriction. Yeah, or I eat one to. meal a day. You know, the, the, I think there's a variety of different approaches, right, that you can take. Um, so there's, there's straight caloric restriction. There's restricting a single sort of macronutrient, like protein restriction. Or there's getting down very fine and restricting one amino acid, like methionine restriction. All of those, there's some evidence that they can have beneficial effects in the context of aging. Um, and then there are these sort of time-restricted feeding paradigms, like intermittent fasting, where in a mouse, maybe you feed them every other day. Um, and so... so Right. I mean, th well, this is this is where it gets really hard because I think a lot of what is happening now is people are trying to extract what's been done in mice to and bring that to humans, um, but often in very simplistic ways for which there is no actual data to support that. Uh, so, as an example, you know, if we feed mice every other day and we see there are some beneficial effects with that. Do we just do the same thing in people? You can eat every other day. Um, maybe that would work, but mice in the lab are, first of all, completely different than people in the real world, and mice age about 25 to 30 times faster than we do. So is a day in a mouse the same as a month in a person? Is it the same as a week in a person? Is it the same as three days in a person? We just don't know. Um, so I think that there are some, some real challenges with just assuming that what works in a mouse the equivalent sort of approach is going to work in people. Um, but unfortunately, you see a lot of these. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. I mean, I, I, to, to my perspective, I, this is a little bit um, disturbing to me that it seems like a, a, a part of the field is moving away from science into diet guru kind of stuff. And, and that bothers me because, unfortunately, there's not a lot of rigorous science to back that up, but the, the general public just eats it up. Pardon me. Nice, nice but yeah. <laughs> so, so, but, I, but I think that this is, this is, this is uh, potentially quite damaging to the, to the field because the rest of the scientific community looks at us and they see that and they're like, these guys are selling out. These guys are not doing good science. Um, and I worry that that has a detrimental impact on the way that our field is perceived among the rest of the scientific community, among the regulatory agencies, and among the funding bodies. Um, I, and I, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not calling anybody out because I also see the other side of it. I mean, I, I also recognize if you have an intervention that you think works, you see that there's really no good path to actually testing that in humans. And so the only other alternative is to go out on your own and try to get people to start practicing it and see what happens, right? So I get that. I mean, I understand that perspective as well. Um, but I do worry about, about the, the fact that there are now, you know, many different um, diets and lifestyle sort of programs that are being proposed uh, based on mouse data, um, sometimes which is also pretty skimpy, um, and they're actually advocating that people do this uh, with the promise that it's going to slow aging. And, and, and uh, my guess is most of these probably won't. Um, they probably won't be harmful. They, they might be. Uh, I think we just don't know at this point, so it's a concern. So you're cornered at a cocktail party, as you must be all the time, and people say, okay, so you're, you're the guru in the space. You research this all the time. Yeah. What should I be considering from a dietary perspective, aside from the Michael Pollan advice, you know, eat plants, right. not, you know, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Uh, it's just great advice in general, but is there something more based on what you think is happening in the field? What has, if not definitive answer, directional, like, okay, most people agree on this type of a thing. And I'll put it in two categories. One is 
assume that most people are already doing the basics and they're generally healthy and yeah. they don't have any critical health condition. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have an answer for you. Is the, uh, that's the answer, right? I mean, I think that I think that there is there's there's really nothing out there where we have enough data for me to be confident that that you're gonna do better than that. If you're if you're eating a relatively healthy diet, you're not overweight, you're exercising regularly, um, you don't smoke, you don't drink too much. I mean, those are the, the and and I mean, and I know it's really unsatisfying, right? Because we've we've known that for decades, right? Um, uh, but the reality is that's kind of that's kind of where we're at. Um, where we have a and this is in part this is because you know epidemiological studies in humans are are really tough and they're full of of problematic components. So I'll give you an example. So one of the things that is is now. Um, I, I think if you talk to to many people in the field, um, they would generally agree that that a uh, low protein diet is probably a good thing. Um, and there's there's decent data in mice to suggest that that all other things being equal, if you restrict protein, you get uh, bigger effects on lifespan than restricting just carbohydrates or, or just fats. Um, and there's a, there's a little bit of epidemiological data in people to suggest that if people are below 65, a lower protein diet is associated with reduced disease and reduced mortality. Then at about age 65, it flips the other direction. And if you eat a low protein diet, you're in trouble. Um, and we don't understand why that is. The, the, the problem with that is that most slightly of slightly more satisfying though your answer now slightly more satisfying okay good <laughs> so so the, the problem one of the problems with that epidemiological data though is that oh that, I'm getting unsatisfied well again. most of the people that they're studying are not the people we're talking about who are relatively healthy exercise regularly so so I would say that in that population it's not clear at all that a low protein diet is beneficial when you're under age 65. And in fact, it might be the opposite. You could imagine that if you're exercising regularly, you might actually need a little bit more protein to maintain your muscle mass. I mean, I don't know that that's true. I'm just saying it's plausible. So this is where, this is why I don't tend to, uh, so, and, I, and I, I should say, I, I think I tend to be pretty skeptical, even among scientists of, of, of you know, sort of making broad claims. Um, but I don't tend to, to, to draw, I don't have too much faith in any one recommendation at, at this point. Um, I, I'm starting to, to become um, more convinced that uh, periodic fasting, at least in a subset of people, can be beneficial. Um, but it's not the kind of thing that I'm ready to go out and start doing myself, in part because I like to eat. But I mean, even if I, even if I, you know, even if I, that wasn't a consideration, I, I don't know that I'm convinced that for, for the general population, that at least that there's any one recommendation you can make regarding fasting. And, and again, this is, this is part of the challenge, right? When I say fasting, do I mean, you know, a 16-hour fast, a 24-hour fast, a three-day fast? There's data kind of all over the place, and nothing says that one is always good or usually good, and one is always bad or usually bad. And I think, unfortunately, sometimes scientists who, who are in this field tend to make claims that they can't actually back up with the data when it comes to stuff like that. What things in your field do you strongly believe that most people in your field don't? I don't know that I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that I, be, I can't think of anything that I strongly believe that, that most people in the field don't believe. I, sir, I probably more strongly believe, um, some things than many people in the field. Like one thing I believe that I, I think still a lot of people in the field are skeptical about is that the, so, so we haven't talked about rapamycin yet, we will, um, but that there is this perception uh, that rapamycin is a bad drug, that it has bad side effects in people. And um, my belief is that based on the data that's out there, um, it, that's probably not the case. So, so most of that data on side effects from rapamycin comes from sick people who have had organ transplants who are taking lots of other drugs and taking high doses of rapamycin. And even there, the side effects aren't that bad. Um, but in healthy people who are taking low doses of rapamycin and not a bunch of other drugs and have not had an organ transplant, the side effects are pretty minimal. Um, so there is this perception that you could never get healthy older people to take rapamycin because it's a bad drug. I don't think that's true. That's my view of the limited data that's out there. Probably less than half the people in the field would agree with that. Of course, my belief is that's because they don't actually know the data that's out there, but, but that's my opinion. So let's talk about your research and why dogs. Right. So, uh, 
So there, I, there are lots of reasons why, I, and in particular, pet dogs, right? So I, I, yeah. I think that's an important distinction. Maybe back up since I jumped there quickly. <laughs> I wanted to get you going on the... I know a little bit about that, but let's talk about your research specifically in this category and with dogs. Sure. Yeah. So, so this really stems out of um, a, a, a challenge that I think has been facing the field for um, several years now, which is how do we actually start to test whether the things that work in the laboratory work in the real world? And this gets back to the TAME trial. I think that there are some difficulties both on a regulatory side and uh, from a feasibility side of actually testing something like dietary restriction or rapamycin or metformin um, in people to ask whether or not these interventions slow aging. One is we don't have good biomarkers, which means it's a really long and expensive study. Um, and so, you know, lots of people in the field have been thinking about this and, and trying to come up with solutions. I think the TAME trial is a really smart sort of uh, approach to, 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 to attack this in the human population. Um, through a series of conversations with, with Daniel Promislow, who's the co-director of the Dog Aging Project, um, I sort of came to the conclusion that pet dogs offer a really unique opportunity to, to make this step, to, to come out of the laboratory into the real world and actually start to ask whether some of these interventions that we're studying in the laboratory can slow aging in a large animal living in the human environment. Um, and so there are lots of reasons, I think, why pet dogs... Uh, offer this sort of unique um, opportunity. Um, one is dogs age very much like we do. So they get all of the same age-related diseases that people do. They're age-related in dogs, um, but they age faster than we do, right? I mean, this is an idea that I think, you know, it, the average person can understand, right? From the time we're kids, we sort of accept that one human year is about seven dog years. That's just another way of saying dogs age about seven times faster than we do. And that's true. Um, so. So the fact that they age very much like we do, but they age much more rapidly, gives us an opportunity to actually test interventions like rapamycin in a reasonable time frame. So it's feasible now to actually do a lifespan experiment or a health span experiment and ask, does an intervention have beneficial effects in the context of aging? Um, another great thing about dogs is not only do they age faster, that's not, that's not a great thing, first of all, let me rephrase that. It sucks that dogs age faster than we do. But as an owner of three dogs, that's right. Dog, <laughs> Somebody who loves dog his lover, dogs very and more much. More dog right? lovers in the room. Yeah. Uh, but given and that, um, veterinarians over the last few decades have become very good at recognizing and treating geriatric dogs. So there's been a major cultural shift um, in the United States and in other developed countries over the last few decades where people have gone generally from thinking of their pets as property to thinking of their pets as family. And as part of that cultural shift, veterinarians have started to, to learn a lot about treating old dogs. And so we have this, we have this uh, uh, group of trained medical professionals who understand aging from a clinical perspective in dogs. And so we can actually do clinical work on aging in dogs, and we have these trained professionals that, who can help us with that. Um, a big one, though, is that dogs share our environment, and that's really where I think we can differentiate uh, from laboratory studies. They allow us to actually ask the question, do these interventions work in the human environment? Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I usually do when I'm giving a talk on this is, you know, I'll have people raise their hands. How many, how many of you have dogs or have had dogs? And usually about half the room will put their hands up. And then I say, okay, you don't have to, you don't have to keep your hands up, but but I bet a lot of you actually let your dog sleep in your bed with you, right? And that's just to make the point that it's hard to imagine, with the exception of cats, I know cat people uh, get, they ask me, why are you doing this in dogs rather than cats? But, uh, but with the exception of cats, it's hard to imagine an animal that shares our environment to a greater extent than we do. Diet is probably the one area that we can't really uh, match in pet dogs, but with the exception of diet, they really share the human environment. Um, so that's a big, a big, uh, a big deal, I think, from trying to actually test interventions. Um, and then, of course, people love their dogs. So I think that this has a, uh, it has a citizen science component. So the people, the owners are actually participating um, in the study, as are the dogs, obviously. Um, but it also has a public uh, outreach component where I think people, people get this in a way that they don't, they don't, the average person does not necessarily uh, relate to an article, you know, in Newsweek that talks about slowing aging in people. I think if you ask a lot of people, 
would you want to live longer? There's a gut reaction among a lot of people that they don't, right? Um, but if you start talking about making their dogs live longer and be healthier longer, nobody can argue with that, right? At least nobody should argue with that. Um, so, so I think that it, 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 really, it really resonates with, with people um, in a way that talking about trying to slow human aging doesn't. And then because I'm a dog person, I recognize that there's, there's intrinsic value in actually making our pets live longer. That has quality of life implications both for the pets and, and for the owners. So I, those are, that's not all of the reasons, but I think those are the big ones why I, I'm really um, excited and enthusiastic about, about actually trying to, to move this forward in pet dogs. And what interventions are you most focused on? Right. So right now, we're only focused on rapamycin as an intervention. Um, we had to start somewhere. And so uh, I picked rapamycin um, because, in my view, if you look at the body of literature, uh, from a pharmacological perspective, rapamycin is the drug that has the biggest effect and is the most consistent. Everybody gets it to work, and, and it, it increases lifespan in mice by between 10 and 30 percent, depending on the dose, and it seems to delay essentially all of the diseases and declines in function that go along with aging. Um, you can't, at least I, I don't know of another drug that, um, that is as effective and as consistent as rapamycin. We could have thought about something like dietary restriction and, and did think about it, but when you think about actually getting owners to, to stick with the plan, um, you know, telling them they have to restrict their dog's diet by 30 uh, percent is challenging. There's also already been one study on dietary restriction that was in dogs in the laboratory where it seemed to have a positive effect. So it's, it's kind of already been done. So we felt that rapamycin was the, was the right choice to start with. Um, and I think, and I still think that's true. Um, I will say though, you know, one of the things that I, uh, that I'm interested in and hopeful about is that this won't end with rapamycin. I think rapamycin is the first, but I certainly recognize that there are other interventions out there that could, and in my view, should be tested in pet dogs now. And in the future, there will be additional interventions that probably work better than rapamycin. And I think that this model of testing them in pet dogs makes a ton of sense for, for interventions other than rapamycin. And I hope that if it's not me, that somebody actually pushes that forward and, and tests other interventions in pet dogs. Um, the, the, the key, I think, thing that has to be um, very carefully thought about and, and made crystal clear from the, the outset is an intervention is only appropriate for testing in pet dogs if you're rock solid sure it can be done safely. And so you really have to do all the upfront safety work before you start enrolling pet dogs in a veterinary clinical trial to test a drug for aging because the last thing we want to do is is to hurt somebody's pet, right? So I think that if that if that's true and you can test your intervention safely in pet dogs, I, I would really like to see additional interventions. And I think a really um, a really good candidate right now would be these NAD precursors, nicotinamide riboside, nicotinamide mononucleotide. Um, you know, these things are already being sold to people. People are taking them. I know some people who are giving it to their dogs. Um, it's just blindingly obvious to me that somebody really should just do the intervention trial in pet dogs and figure out, do these things work or not? There's nothing keeping that from being done. It's not even prohibitively expensive by the, the, the metrics of a clinical trial. It just requires the will and, and, and a funder to pay for it. But, so outside of NAD and RAP, if money were no object, what would be the next two interventions you'd want to try on dogs? So I'd, I'd certainly think about metformin. Um, there's some literature on metformin in dogs. Um, uh, so we, we, we have some, in, uh, some data on safety. I think about acarbos. So um, for those of your listeners who aren't familiar with acarbos, this is, so there's this, this uh, project called the NIA Interventions Testing Program. This is a project where anybody from the scientific community can nominate a drug, usually a drug. In, in principle, it could be other types of interventions as well. Um, can nominate an intervention to be tested for lifespan in mice. It goes through a formal review process. Um, and if it's selected, it gets tested for its effects on lifespan at three different sites. This was actually where rapamycin was first shown to extend lifespan in mice was through this program. Um, so they've tested now, you know, a, a couple dozen compounds and interventions. Um, and acarbose is the second most effective behind rapamycin at increasing lifespan. 
Um, the, acarbose is an anti-diabetic drug. Um, it's, it's not the first-line anti-diabetic drug in the United States. Metformin is. And that's, that's largely because, um, at least in people eating a Western diet, it often has unfortunate gastrointestinal side effects. Nothing serious, but not comfortable. Um, but for lifespan in mice, it's the second most effective. So I would think about that in dogs. The worry there is that if it has... Uh, gastrointestinal consequences in dogs, it may be hard to get owners to keep giving a carbos to their dogs. Yeah, if you uh, dietary <laughs> restrict your dog and you have dietary <laughs> and, and intestinal issues, they are a lot less fun to sleep with. That's right. I'm 100% That's sure right. of that. Yes. 100%. Yes, you're right. So uh, so I would at least think about a carbos and pilot it and see if it has the same sort of gastrointestinal side effects in dogs. Um, the area that's, that's really interesting right now uh, to me are these senolytics. So these are drugs that are thought to um, clear out senescent cells and specifically target senescent cells in aged organisms. There have been a couple of papers that have come out fairly recently showing that um, different combinations of senolytic drugs um, can have uh, very impressive health benefits in mice and at least uh, one report of lifespan extension in mice. I think like many people in the field, I still have some concerns about safety for these senolytic drugs. So I'd, I'd want to um, I'd want to do a little bit more background work to make sure that we could come up with a, 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 a either a single or cocktail of of compounds that we think have senolytic properties, where we're also quite sure that they're going to be safe in dogs. But I. I I don't think that's a, a, a burden that we can't overcome. And so I think that that's, that's where I would look kind of as the, in the future, um, would be, uh, testing whether senolytic compounds can have positive effects on health span and lifespan in dogs. And, and I think given what's been seen in mice, there's really good reason for optimism that that would be the case. Aubrey Duguay is going to turn out to be right. About what? About senolytics. I think so. Yeah, well... He was on the podcast we recorded, and uh, it was fascinating to, to talk about the, the history of at least his perspective in this category of senolytics. Yeah, I, I think Aubrey has some interesting perspectives. Um, yeah, so I think uh, what, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested to see is whether we can do any better with senolytics than we can do with rapamycin. Um, so far, they look to be pretty comparable, and nobody has done the experiment yet of combining them, which will be obviously a really interesting experiment. Um, it would not shock me if rapamycin is essentially doing the same thing that senolytics are by a slightly different mechanism. So I think we'll have to wait and see. What I don't think you're going to get is 100% extension in lifespan from senolytics alone. You might. I'd love to be wrong. But, but uh, from what I've seen of the data so far, it looks to be pretty comparable to the effects of rapamycin. Given what you're doing today, are you interested in connecting with more dog owners? We happen to have a partner of mine that started <laughs> Rover.com. Yeah. So and we're, certain, we're always interested in connecting with more, more dog owners. I would say at this point... Um, we're not quite ready to, uh, to connect with tens of thousands of dog owners. I think by early next year, we'll have all the infrastructure in place. So I haven't talked about the other part of the dog aging project yet. So there's the rapamycin intervention trials. There's actually th three of them. We're in the middle of the second one right now. The third one will be starting early next year. Um, then, then there's also a larger longitudinal study of aging. So the, the, the largest rapamycin trial that's planned right now is 600 dogs. I mean, we just can't take more than that. We just don't have the funding to, to take more dogs than that. The longitudinal study of aging, which is non-interventional, will be at least 10,000 dogs. And so I think we'll have the infrastructure in place by early next year to actually start to, um, to, to recruit owners and recruit dogs into that study. Um, and so absolutely, we're... we're uh, very interested and excited about getting the word out and and um, having you know ten twenty thirty thousand people participate in that study and for people who are interested in this, where can they find out more about the dog aging project and or you online right so um, the dog aging project website is dogagingproject dot com so i 'd certainly recommend that people go uh, to the website sign up for our newsletter that 's probably the best thing to do at this point because as soon as we are ready to go. We're going um, to we're going to contact everybody who's who signed up for the newsletter or completed one of our enrollment forms online. People can certainly go and nominate their dogs to be in the studies now. So we have enrollment forms um, on the website. Um, don't be surprised if you don't hear anything back from us for a few months, because as I said, I think it'll probably be early next year before we can really start to um, start to formally enroll dogs into the study. 
And is there a particular kind of dog, dog owner that you're looking for? Right. So for the, for the rapamycin intervention trials, um, the dogs all have to be middle-aged. So they have to be, for the phase three trial, they have to be at least seven years old and they have to be at least 40 pounds. And that's because big dogs age faster than small dogs. So we need a population of dogs that are middle-aged and aging rapidly to really be able to quantitatively assess whether rapamycin is slowing aging in dogs. For the longitudinal study, we, we, it's all, it takes all comers. So we want big dogs, small dogs, rich dogs, poor dogs, healthy dogs, lazy dogs. We want them all. And, and, and part, of the, part of what we want to accomplish with the longitudinal study is really to understand throughout the entire life course of pet dogs, not only what are the genetic um, correlations with healthy longevity, but what are the environmental factors that most strongly influence healthy longevity? And so we want to capture as broad a spectrum of the companion animal space as we can in order to really be able to make those correlations. We talked about the studies that are happening in mice and obviously your work in dogs. What's happening with rapamycin in humans? So, so as I, I mentioned earlier, rapamycin has a, a fairly long clinical track record in people of being used uh, to prevent organ transplant rejection in, in people who've had uh, organ transplants. Um, and one of the one of the uh, implications of that is is that um, there is this perception in the clinical community that there are lots of side effects associated with with rapamycin. Um, uh, the the most common side effect is actually mouth sores. So it's not a particularly um, it's not a particularly great health concern, but it causes lots of people to stop taking the drug because they don't like to have sores in their mouths. Um, but the biggest concern that people worry about is that rapamycin would impair immune function. Um, and so what we've seen recently, which is, I think, counterintuitive but really interesting, are a couple of uh, clinical trials where people are starting to ask, what is the effect of rapamycin alone? And actually, to be a little bit more precise, it's not rapamycin, it's a derivative of rapamycin. It's called a rapalog. It works exactly the same way. Um, the drug is called Everolimus. Um, they've, they've asked the question, what is the effect of this derivative of rapamycin on immune function in healthy elderly people? Um, and so what they've seen, and this is based on work that was first done in mice. This is a, a study from Pan Zheng's lab in mice. Um, what they've seen in the human studies is if you take healthy elderly people and you give them six weeks of treatment with this rapamycin derivative, they actually have better immune function. They respond better to an influenza vaccine than people who got the placebo. Um, and that was in the first study. And now most recently in the second study, not only are they uh, better able to respond to the flu vaccine, they also seem to be protected for up to the next year from respiratory tract infections. So this really suggests that short-term treatment with rapamycin in mice or this rapamycin derivative in people can actually cause the aged immune system to function more like a young immune system, which is, I think, really exciting. And this also kind of comes back to this, um, this issue that we were, we were addressing earlier, which is, you know, how do you start to, to make a path from the basic science in, in aging research into the clinic? We talked about the TAME trial. That's one strategy. I think this is a, a, another strategy which is very compelling to look at um, functional measures of aging, in this case, immune function, where we can actually quantify pretty well how much the immune system is declining and ask whether your intervention can either delay further decline or, in the case of rapamycin, actually make it better. Um, and so I think that's a strategy that people are thinking about um, in, in terms of moving from the laboratory into the clinic in terms of interventions that seem to affect aging. And again, rapamycin is, is sort of the poster child for this, but um, you could imagine senolytics could have similar sort of restorative effects for functional declines that go along with aging. Fun fact, do you know where the name rapamycin originates? Yeah, it comes from Rapa Nui, which, which is where uh, the drug was discovered. Yeah, which is Easter Island. Right. right. And which I, it's on my bucket list of places to go. I haven't made it. You have yet. to go there, I, for I, sure. Yeah, I, All right, I I'm adding it to my bucket list, too. It was high, but now it's higher, given, the, given this nature with rapamycin. Yeah. You know, we're, we're fortunate to all be in Seattle, and you at the University of Washington. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the um, Shock Center of Excellence there at UW. So, um, so we have one of six uh, Nathan Shock Centers of Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging. These are um, centers of excellence that are funded by the, the NIH. Um, and all of these centers have the mission of 
promoting um, research into the basic biology of aging. And, and one of the main things that the centers do is they build on the expertise of scientists at their home institution to provide services to the broader scientific community. So within our shock center, we have um, three cores. We have a, a proteomics core to look at um, changes in protein level or protein modification. Um, we have a metabolomics core which looks at the abundance of uh, different metabolites in different biological tissues. And then we have an invertebrate longevity and health span core, which is what I direct, where we um, facilitate research into aging in invertebrate models. And so what this center does is it allows scientists, both from the University of Washington and from around the country, to, um, to take advantage of those cores if they have specific research questions in the biology of aging that they want to answer that, um, that can benefit from the services of those cores. The other thing that the Shock Center does, which I think is really important, is it um, helps to create a community of researchers at the institution with a shared vision of understanding the biology of aging. And we're really fortunate at UW um, that, that we have, I would say, one of the strongest academic communities in the biology of aging anywhere in the world. And part of that is because we have the Shock Center, we also have a training grant in aging that supports um, six postdocs and six graduate students. We have several faculty who have an interest in this field. Um, <clears throat> we also have a long history in the biology of aging. So uh, George Martin, who sort of many people think of him as, as kind of the grandfather of, of aging research, um, he was the one who started the Shock Center. I think it's 30 some years ago now. In fact, we're, we're we, we were one of two institutions, I think, that have had a shock center from its very beginning all the way through till today. Um, and so George was the one who started that, and he really, I think, built the, the groundwork for the, the, the outstanding community of aging researchers we have at UW now. Matt, thank you for doing all the work in this research area, and thank you for protecting our dogs and helping <laughs> them live a lot longer. Um, it's been great to have you on the show. Great. Thank you. You've been listening to another episode of How to Live to 200. Thank you so much for joining me and exploring this world together. I get a ton of help from the L200 crew that includes Lauren Krajinski and Kevin Kirkpatrick. The theme music is composed by Emmett McCann. Yes, that's my nephew. You can learn more about this and other episodes at our website, livingto200.com, or find us on Twitter or Instagram at How to Live to 200, where we post lots of photos of cool things. It's early days for this podcast, so we would appreciate any and all comments or telling a friend or two about what we're doing over here. It might be irresponsible for you to keep it a secret. Until next time, eat right, get lots of sleep, keep good numbers, and be looking around the corner for the next big breakthrough. If we're going to live a long time, we better do it well. <laughs>